Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jess Steyer and Dr. Sarah Scheinman. Oh, love it, Sarah. That will never get old. Um, we are super excited today to welcome a very special guest. I'll introduce her in just one moment. But the topic today is going to be respiratory virus season and the importance of vaccines. Yes, this is a topic that we have covered ad nauseum on Unbiased Science, but respiratory season is upon us. Um, there are some important updates and changes to the vaccines that are available to us. So so we thought, you know, a timely refresher could not hurt. Uh, so on that note, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bertha Hidalgo. Bertha is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and associate dean for the Office of Access and Engagement at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health. Dr. Hidalgo holds a BA from Stanford, an MPH from USC, and a PhD from UAB, where she also completed a postdoctoral fellowship in statistical genetics. No big deal. Um, <laughs> Bertha was heavily involved in science communication during the first two years of the COVID pandemic and has since continued to connect lay audiences with up-to-date information related to COVID and other public health messages. Uh, we will link to her page in our show notes, but definitely go ahead and give her a follow at dr.berthahidalgo. And again, we'll link to that in show notes. Bertha, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm so pleased to be with you both. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, and and Bertha, just as a, a, a brief aside, we we've chatted briefly about how we both kind of like our roots are really more in chronic disease, right? Uh, but we've sort of evolved uh, our, our focus to also include, of course the very timely COVID pandemic and other infectious diseases, which are uh, critical to, to the field of public health. Obviously, that goes without saying. But I thought that was interesting that we both kind of went through that career evolution. Yeah. All right. So we thought, oh, sorry, did you want to comment on that at all? No, no. <laughs> no, thank you. Yes. Okay. Agree. So, so, all right. So we thought it might make sense to kick off this episode with a little bit of a an icebreaker relevant to the topic at hand. So Bertha and Sarah, can you share, are you willing to share, have you experienced, let's start with COVID. Have you experienced COVID recently? Have you ever had it or have you been one of the rare people <laughs> who've been able to, to avoid it? I feel like I don't know anyone who's been able to avoid it completely at this point. I mean, I, I, if, if you are, I, I'm impressed. Um, I, I, uh, I actually got COVID, uh, about a year and a half ago, um, after attending a, a very, very large, uh, neuroscience conference. And, um, you know, there were just thousands, tens of thousands of people there coming in from all over the world. Um, it was an international gathering and, um, I was presenting uh, a scientific poster. So I was talking to a lot of people. I was shaking a lot of hands. Um, and I, uh, I came back home from the conference and just immediately was, was laid out for just 10 straight days. It, it was miserable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bertha, did you have a similar experience? Uh, yes. So I recently had COVID for the very first time. So Sarah, <laughs> I had evaded it, uh, all of these years until, uh, until, gosh, I don't even know, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, and uh, very similarly was out, I think I tested positive for 10 days and was, um, uh, I had I had somewhat of a normal distribution for my, my statistics nerds out there. So um, I, I had a, an easing in of symptoms and then it like peaked 
uh, where I felt super sick for about two days and then it came down where I started to improve, but the improvement had a really long right tail. So um, very interesting experience, but um, yeah, it, w it was uh, for all that people hear about uh, COVID being more mild than uh, in the past, that was certainly not my experience. And so very interesting to observe how people feel um, once they have it. Um, yeah, but yeah, definitely hit me. Yeah, and that was my experience as well. So I've had it twice, not to brag. No, no, <laughs> certainly joking about that. But no, I had it for the first time in November 2022. It was right after a Thanksgiving gathering with family. Um, and then recently in July, and obviously we're in a major summer wave right now, um, it ripped through my kids' camp. And for me, both times, it really hit me very, very hard. Um, the first time in particular, um, it was... Uh, yeah, very high fever, extreme fatigue that I've never experienced before. Um, yeah. All the other things, you know, runny nose, sore throat, horrible headache. Um, and actually, both times I lost my what was it, anosmia. I lost my sense of smell and taste um, for about seven to 10 days. Uh, and this last time it was quite similar, except I didn't have fever. Uh, so it was brutal. But then interestingly, the others in my household, so my husband and my two young kids, they had milder cases. And I think mm -hmm. that's the thing about COVID that gets me the most is that it, it impacts people. Like it doesn't really seem to have a rhyme or reason. You know, I, I'm not a person who's particularly high risk or immunocompromised, but I still got extraordinarily sick. And that's the thing about COVID that scares me. And of course, we're not just talking about acute symptoms with COVID. Many people have gone on to experience long symptoms, you know, long-term symptoms. Of course, we all know the term long COVID right now, even though we don't fully understand, um, you know, what that is exactly. Uh, but COVID's mm -hmm. not a joke. Um, and, and certainly, you know, the same for the flu. Um, I don't know if, you, if you've all had the flu, but I have had the flu um, twice in my life. Uh, and again, both times it was, it was awful. You know, it was a week off of, of, of work for me in both instances. I felt awful. Uh, and because I'm not high risk, I luckily did not have to be hospitalized, but I see how, you know, people end up in the hospital. I mean, it really wallops you, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just I just had the flu um a couple a couple weeks ago after I came back from uh, a, another conference. I conferences wow. are really cesspools of disease honestly. <laughs> like I I I pretty much consistently get sick after I come back from conferences. I mean, but it does kind of make sense, right? I mean, like it is a very it's a it's a large gathering with people coming from different parts of the world, different parts of the country where different strains which we're going to talk about are circulating and more prevalent and you know you get a whole bunch of people together and i mean they used to be called super spreader events um back in the heyday of the of the pandemic and uh right but it still is the case that that there there's a lot of virus a lot of germs circulating at these types of gatherings and I know we're kind of going out of order here, um, but one thing that I hear quite a bit through Unbiased Science, like, you know, the page itself, I'll get comments from people, well, you got the vaccine and you still got super sick. And then, you know, I know someone who didn't get the vaccine and they didn't get very sick. And I, you know, this is my non-biologist, non-immunologist take on it, but you know, I, I think the vaccine is bolstering our protection, right? And so I, as an individual, we all have different immune systems. Our bodies are going to react differently to the virus. So I think about myself, oh my goodness, how would my body have reacted to that virus if I did not, you know, I, again, I'm sorry, Sarah, if you'll yell at me, but like prime my immune system to it. And that's why we can't rely on these one-off anecdote stories, right? And that's, we have so much popula population level data that show us how much better people fare who are vaccinated versus those who are not vaccinated. And so, yeah, so there there are going to be these stories, these, you know, anecdotes. Oh, I know this person who didn't get vaccinated and they got it and they didn't get very sick. That person is quite lucky, but when we zoom out and we look at the population level data, that's just not what we're seeing. And the majority of people who are getting very sick and dying from the virus are those who are either very high risk or unvaccinated. So, all right, 
let's jump in. Sarah, maybe you can kick things off. I know you love a definition. What are we talking about? Set the stage here when we're talking about viruses um, and vaccines, just high level. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So a virus is a teeny tiny microscopic bundle of genetic material. So that's either D- usually DNA or RNA, and it's wrapped in um, a nice little protein shell, like the outer coating of an m M&M. and um, Viruses are not living, uh, so they can't really do anything on their own. So in order to replicate, uh, these like tiny little infectious agents have to enter into our cells And that's how they make more virus particles and spread throughout the body and make us sick. Now, a vaccine is sort of a primer, like you said, Jess. I think that's a really good word to use, actually. So it's a primer for our immune system. And, um, you know, I love a good analogy. Um, I like to think of vaccines as sort of like getting the answers to a test ahead of time. So it's, it's sort of like um, an immune system cheat sheet. So the job of our immune system, just very broadly, is to constantly be checking the body for foreign invaders or intruders, um, viruses, but also other infectious agents. Um, but we're talking viruses today. And what a vaccine does is it uses a little piece of the virus And um, this little piece of the virus is not infectious by itself, so it's not going to make you sick. But what it's going to do is it's going to build up our defenses to keep us from getting sick by kind of giving our immune system the answers to the test ahead of time so that if we are ever exposed to the actual pathogen, then we have already these lines of defense built up. We know the answers. Our body has already produced the necessary agents to fight off this this disease. They're called antibodies. And this provides some sort of protection against illness. Love it. That was such a great explanation. Um, And I just, I also want to say right at the start of this episode that the people on this call, we, of course, you know, yes, we see uh, based on the data, the power of vaccination, but vaccines are just one part of the puzzle, right, in our protection against these respiratory viruses. We always talk about the Swiss cheese model, how there's multiple layers and things that we could do. That's why masking is so important, especially because when you think about how these viruses are spread, right, obviously masks are going to help serve as a, as a barrier uh, to, to prevent transmission. So just briefly talking about transmission um, with respiratory viruses, we're talking about droplet transmission. So when virus containing droplets are expelled when we cough or when we sneeze or when we talk, Um, aerosol transmission. So that's when smaller particles can remain airborne for longer periods. And fomite transmission uh, when the virus lives on contaminated uh, surfaces, right? Um, And we know that that's like less common for the respiratory. Really, the main way is through the the respiratory droplet transmission, uh, but, but worth mentioning. Um, okay. Anything, Bertha, that you wanted to jump in at this time, or should we talk a little bit about, or maybe you could take, uh, you know, talk about how the viruses are changing, uh, and and how that's why we have an updated vaccine every year. Maybe this is a good point to shift gears to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I I think that one thing that I loved for pe- that I love for people to know and understand is that especially uh, lay audiences, um, you know, in general, as a population, we're very binary in our thinking. It's like, yes, no, dead, alive, vaccinated, not vaccinated, sick, not sick. And there's so much gray area in all of that. Like, you know, I mentioned I had COVID this summer. My last vaccine um, I received in September of last year. There's there's time that has passed, almost a year since I was vaccinated. And so that protection sort of dwindles over time, right? It reduces over time, which means um, by the summer, I was probably susceptible and I probably should have taken greater caution, especially on that plane ride where I'm almost 100% certain that I uh, picked up the virus from somebody. So, um, the the thing with viruses is that these these viruses uh though um though not human are are actively working to be the best versions of themselves 
And what they're trying to do, right, is infect as many people as possible. And in order to do that, they have to change. They have to evolve. And so what we see over time are these variations of the original, but variations that have become better at infecting, better at staying alive over the course of time. Um, and so these variants that, that we see are... Um, Really, if you break it down, sort of these changes in their genetic code. Um, and um, in some cases, these genetic changes in the code um, may result in better, more efficient versions of the virus that um, you may hear in the news, for example, um, oh, this variant is very infectious. Like, you know, and so and so there's there are changes that happen with the virus that allow it to Yes, become better at infecting people. It may change the symptoms that we see with um, the different seasons. Um, right now, for example, we've also observed that there is about it, like a sort of like a camel, like a two hump um, seasonality to COVID, where we see uh, COVID cases increase late summer when people are traveling. There's international travel because people are out of school, kids are out of school. And then another hump or another surge sort of in the winter. And so um, antigenic drift and shift are sort of the more formal terms that we assign to how these viruses change over time. But in in um, basic terms, they're essentially trying just to be the best versions of themselves and not die out. Um, in in their ability to mm -hmm. continue to infect humans. Okay, first of all, Bertha, I love that your brain kind of operates in statistical graphs and that everything you've described has been like a, you know, the normal curve. And I just, I love that. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's the mark of a true scientist. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but but also, I, I totally agree. It's like people are getting surprised in the news. It's like, this is the most infectious strain. Yeah, you know, the virus is changing, as you said, even though it's not a, you know, a thinking being <laughs> to, to be the best version of itself and to infect as many people as possible. Um, but to your point, I mean, it also, it doesn't necessarily mean that, well, that it's more lethal or that it causes more symptoms, but it may, right, as, as the virus changes. Um, I wanted to point out that there are some incredible, what we call ge genomic surveillance efforts underway. We're constantly monitoring around the world changes in influenza, in SARS-CoV-2. Um, so just a few things not to get too technical here, but there's something called whole genome sequencing. So that's the primary method for identifying and tracking new variants. Um, you all know, I think now that, you know, we do wastewater monitoring. So that's when uh, we take sewage samples and we're testing them. Uh, you know, th these are often a very good early warning of outbreaks. They help us track variants in communities. There is also, and I get questions about this a lot, uh, you know, PCR testing, it's less common now, but obviously, yes, we are still doing PCR testing. My, my husband works in the ER and urgent care setting. The PCR, that's what they use in those settings. And so we do have those data and we are able to, you know, to understand what, what the different strains are, how the virus is, um, is changing. So I thought this could be a good segue to talk about one of the major changes that is happening this year with the flu vaccine. Um, we're actually moving from a quadrivalent vaccine to a trivalent vaccine. And what this means is that um, the vaccine is going to pr protect against three strains of influenza. And there are different strains. We Again, we've, talk, we've covered this quite a bit on, on the pod, right? But I think most people know there's like an A strain, a B strain, and then within those, there are different subtypes, right? So this 2024 to 2025 flu vaccine is going to cover three of those strains. It's the H1N1, which is influenza A, H3N2, which is influenza A as well. And then it's uh, also going to protect against the Victoria lineage of influenza B. 
Now, the big change this year is that it's not going to protect against the Yamagata strain, which is a, a, a subtype of flu B. And the reason being that because we have this incredible genomic surveillance and we're constant, constantly monitoring what's going on, we've noticed that this particular strain has not been detected in circulation since early in the pandemic. So for whatever reason, it seems to have been snuffed out we're not monitor we're not picking it up in our you know constant monitoring efforts and so there's no reason to include it right and so again this is just a, a way to illustrate how we're constantly monitoring and we're only including in the vaccine what we need to include something else that i don't think folks realize is that and now i'm speaking specifically about the flu vaccine is that you know, as Bertha, you mentioned, there's seasonality. And whereas, you know, here in the U.S., we typically experience flu season from like, you know, early fall through the winter. That's not the case in other parts of the world. So in the Southern Hemisphere, for example, they experience a flu season at a very different time, actually before us, <laughs> before we do, right? And so we use data from the Southern Hemisphere to help us predict what is going to circulate here in the U.S. and in the Northern Hemisphere, right? And we do so to try to create the best possible flu vaccine, but it's not always a great prediction, right? We do our best. There are some years where the flu vaccine provides great protection, um, and there are some years where it's just not a great match. But I, just, I thought maybe we could just talk a little bit about how vaccines are updated to protect against circulating strains. Does anyone want to jump in and talk a little bit about that more? Don't all uh, jump in. <laughs> no, I think I, I, I was going to say, I think, I think Bertha, you should, you should feel this one. This is, this seems like, um, yeah, sure. No problem. So, um, I, I think the point I'd like to make before talking about that specifically is that we, I mentioned that we as a society are very binary in our thinking, right? And so um, what I want to remind people about is that with flu and COVID and the common cold and all of these things, while there is seasonality, which means that it's when we're observing the, the greatest amount of cases at any given time, that, that does not mean that these viruses are not circulating during the off season, if you will, right? And so they are circulating at low levels, and it just so happens that when there is um, an increase in cases, that's when we sort of define the season for flu or COVID or, um, you know, for, for those that have young kids, um, the stomach virus, which tends to take out entire households. And so... Um, and so I think that um, to that end, that's an important point to consider. Um, the the tracking data, uh, just that you described in terms of genomic surveillance, again, does help manufacturers of vaccine predict the variants or the variations of the virus that we will see uh, circulating that year. And so then the vaccines are adapted, formulated, made, if you will, um, for that season to match as closely to the variations of the viruses that are going to be targeted for those specific vaccines in those seasons. And so those data that you talked about are what have informed the vaccines that for COVID, for example, was recently released, um, the vaccine that we'll see for flu that is now available also for people to um, get for the upcoming flu season. Um, and it was really interesting also that when we had those stay at home periods early in the pandemic, it actually kind of shifted when we saw increases in cases of viruses like flu um, in, in our populations in the U.S. And so we were kind of seeing a shift in seasonality for some of the usual things that we would normally see late fall to early winter. And, uh, and so um, we're, we seem to be back-ish to normal. Uh, where, yes, we will expect that flu cases will increase again this fall and through the winter in the southern U.S., for example, where I am located, we tend to see a lot of flu January and February, less flu, um, less um, uh, 
uh, greater cases of flu in um, October, November, December. And for some reason after the holidays, it's when um, we see here in the Southern US that, that really big peak for flu specifically. So um, I hope that answers your, que your question. Yeah. No, that was that was amazing. Um, I think that that's a good segue. I know we don't have a ton of time and we want to give really practical guidance right on the vaccines that are available and timing and then share a little bit about, um, you know, how we know that they're safe and effective. But I just wanted to mention briefly, and again, this is something that we've covered at length, but there are obviously different types of vaccines and vaccine technologies. Just super briefly, when it comes to the flu vaccine, a very common myth that, that I hear a lot is that, oh, you know, the flu vaccine gave me the flu. And that's simply not possible because the main type of flu vaccine that is available is called the inactivated influenza vaccine, IIV. The, the virus is completely inactivated. It can, which means it's killed, sorry. Um, and it cannot cause you to get the flu, right? Um, and just another thing I wanted to note is that there are different ways that the flu vaccines are developed, um, different production methods. They're typically grown in eggs or in cell culture. Uh, and something, a recent update, and I, I did want to flag this and perhaps we could talk about this, you know, again and really drive it home. There was this idea, and Berth, I'm sure you've seen this, that people with egg allergies, they thought that they couldn't get the flu vaccine, especially, you know, the egg-based vaccines. And there was a lot of concern about that. You, even if you have a severe egg allergy, the current CDC recommendation is that you can get any approved flu vaccine, regardless of whether or not it was grown, you know, in a cell or if it's egg based. Flu vaccines are safe. I just wanted to mention that. So, two main myths that I think we just tackled are the flu vaccine cannot be the flu, and you can safely get the flu vaccine even if you have an egg allergy. Um, there are other types of flu vaccines, maybe just worth mentioning uh, briefly. Uh, there are some adjuvanted vaccines. There are some higher dose vaccines. And those are recommended for older adults and for certain immunocompromised individuals. Um, and that's because just in lay speak, um, as we age and if we're immunocompromised, um, we're, you know, we don't develop as much of a robust immune response. And so sometimes we require a higher dose or again, an, an adjuvanted vaccine is when we have something that's, it's an ingredient that's added to flu vaccines to help bolster the response that our body um, creates uh, against the virus. Am I totally botching this, Sarah? Are you killing, are you, am I killing you from a bio perspective? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, honestly, yeah, this is, this is all correct. One thing that I that I did want to ask you both about um, that we haven't yeah. mentioned yet. We've talked, we've covered COVID, we've covered flu. Um, one thing that I've been hearing a lot about recently, it seems like it's sort of just popped up, um, is this respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. Um, so can either of you talk a little bit about like, what, what is that? Like, why are we, why are we hearing about that now? Um, who is at risk for it? Um, who, who is recommended to get the vaccine? Um, because mm -hmm. I, I, I haven't, I have not gotten the RSV vaccine. I mean, I just, I don't think it's recommended for people in my particular demographic. Um, so can either of you speak to that really briefly? Yeah. Oh, Bertha, do you want to jump in? Sure. Yeah, maybe I'll get started. Um, so uh, RSV is, um, is a virus that, um, I mean, it's not new, right? Not certainly not like COVID, the the virus that causes COVID, SARS-CoV-2, um, and but it is a, a a virus that for some people, especially um, older kids, to I would say like middle-aged adults, like early older ish adults, like maybe fifties and sixties, um, the RSV uh, virus tends to um, not create significant complications in terms of symptoms and illness, um, but it can create very severe illness in young babies who have limited protection against this virus and then also in older adults. And so um, there was a, a lot of 
um, information in the news about vaccinating young kids and um, babies against RSV. Um, it, it, is, it is a virus that is communicated through close touch. You know, lots of people like to kiss babies. Um, and what we are trying to do is ensure that we are not infecting these young babies and exposing older adults to a virus that for yes, a large portion of the population does not create a lot of issue. So we actually also had a chance to interview Dr. Jen Brull, who's the president-elect of the American Academy of Family Physicians. So let's take a second to listen to that discussion and her perspective as a family physician. I am joined now by Dr. Jen Brill, who is a family physician in Fort Collins, Colorado. She's president-elect of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Dr. Brill advocates on behalf of family physicians and patients nationwide to inspire positive changes in the U.S. healthcare system. She practiced family medicine in rural Plainville, Kansas for more than 20 years. She formerly served 12 years as health officer for the Rooks County Health Department and filled several roles as medical director and operations manager of urgent care and surgical clinics in the local community critical access hospital. She's board certified by the American Board of Family Medicine and has the AAFP degree of fellow, which is an earned degree awarded to family physicians for distinguished service and continuing medical education. Dr. Brill, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, all right, so folks have some questions about vaccines, vaccines generally, but then also specifically the respiratory vaccine, since obviously we're, we're coming up on respiratory illness season. So lots of questions specifically about flu and COVID. Um, so I'm hoping we can pick your brain a bit today. Uh, and if I can start with the first question that was submitted by our followers. So, Dr. Brill, with flu season and COVID-19 still circulating, what's the ideal timing for getting both vaccines and is it safe to get them simultaneously? I love that question and I do think it's really high on people's minds. I always tell people the ideal time to get your flu and COVID vaccines is as soon as you can, as soon as they are available to you in your community and you have availability to go do it. The lovely thing is that access to both of these vaccines is no longer something that's hard to get to. So you can see your family doctor, you can go to your local pharmacy, all of those are viable options. We do expect the new COVID and flu vaccines to be available to the public probably in early September. And again, yes, get them as soon as they're available. It is absolutely safe to get them in the same day, even in the same arm if you want to, although I usually do it in different arms. And then um, the other thing to know is that if you are a high risk for COVID and you are in the group for which it was recommended to get a booster of the current COVID vaccine, it's also perfectly acceptable to go get that booster right now and then just wait a little bit into the fall to get your next season's COVID vaccine. Oh, that was so helpful. Thank you. All right, next question. So we've heard about the possibility of a combined COVID and flu vaccine. I get this question all the time. So how close are we to this becoming a reality and what would be the benefits for patients? I, I think that's a question we all have. At this point, I do not have insight into whether there will be a combined vaccine for this fall. There are distinct advantages. I mean, one shot instead of two, who wouldn't take that? Uh, we do know that they are extensively testing the safety and efficacy of doing that combo vaccine. Um, so if it's available this fall, next fall, whenever it is, absolutely okay to get it and saves you a jab. And um, if not, it's okay to get both of them in the same day, as I said before. Mm -hmm. All right. So how are the new COVID variants affecting vaccine effectiveness and how often might we need to update our vaccines in the future? If you follow the news, you know that right now we are in a period of pretty high COVID activity of the variants that are circulating now. 
Um, COVID and flu, interestingly enough, we give them seasonally and they have a lot of ways that they are alike, which is they learn what's working in terms of them being able to infect us and they change. And so that's what we, when we talk about variants, we mean same virus, different way of attacking you and giving it to you. So each year, uh, the CDC and others who are doing vaccine research really try to predict what's going to be both the most common strain or variant and the most worrisome strain or variant. So some of the COVID strains or flu strains that are out there are less likely to make you severely ill. Some are more likely to make you severely ill. And so each year, the folks who build our new vaccine strains are thinking about both of those things and trying to develop vaccines that will protect you from those most common and most worrisome variants of each of those illnesses. Uh, the reason why we encourage people to get their vaccines on a seasonal basis is to update your immunity against those more worrisome and more commonly predicted things in the coming year. It also boosts your immunity in general to those, to those viruses. Um, at this point, flu is very seasonal. We expect to give it every fall and have an update every fall. COVID, we're learning, is highly variable in terms of when it mutates and when it changes. Right now, the current recommendation is get that new one in the fall when it's available. In the future, could we say there's a fall vaccine and a spring vaccine? We could. And it just depends on what we learn as science progresses. Love that. And I, I'm often reminding people that, you know, science is this, it's evolving, right? And so our knowledge is going to evolve. And so as you just said, the guidance may change in the future. All right. So for people who have never had a flu shot or, or maybe are hesitant about the COVID vaccine, what would you say are the most compelling reasons to get vaccinated? Absolutely. Um, so first of all, I want to say anybody who hasn't had a flu vaccine or a COVID vaccine or is worried about getting one, um, the most important thing you do is that you can do is have a great relationship with a family physician, with a primary care physician who can talk to you about your specific risks and your specific benefits and really have that one-on-one -on -one relationship that makes this less generic and more about you. So that's my first piece of advice. Um, my second piece of advice is to know that COVID and flu vaccines at this point are extensively tested. And what we know is, although there can be minor side effects, a sore arm, with the COVID vaccine, you can even just feel a little bit yucky for a day or two. And know that those side effects are your body's way of building the defense system against this virus. They are not going to make you severely ill. They are going to help protect you from what could be severe illness. So that's the personal side. Now, on the global side of things, um, most people in this life have others they love. And those others range in age from very young to very old. And although you may be a person who is not very young or very old, or have comorbid health conditions that make you more at risk, you probably love somebody who fits in one of those conditions. And you getting your vaccine is helping protect them from illness because you surround those loved ones with a bubble of folks who are protected themselves and others they come into contact with. And so even if you feel like you're at pretty low risk for any serious effects from COVID or flu, you can most likely imagine someone around you who is at high risk and you're getting vaccinated helps protect them. So what would you say to people who think that COVID doesn't pose a real threat anymore? So there's no need to get vaccinated. I hear this quite frequently. I'm sure you do as well. How would you respond to that? Um, I think the good news is, and I'll start with the good news, um, COVID is less scary than it was when the pandemic began we are seeing fewer people die. That's good. Um, the bad news is it's not unscary and people are still dying. And to me, that means we still have to really think about this. Um, COVID in some ways does tend to affect those who are older, younger, more at risk of chronic disease and illness and, and um, 
affects chronic disease and health conditions. Um, but it, it also can randomly affect someone who's young and healthy, who can still have significant downstream comorbidities or even death. So um, this isn't a scare tactic. This isn't a, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and there's no hospital beds. We are not there anymore. Um, this is something that we, we don't have COVID's number. We don't have a cure or a treatment or a surefire way that if you get sick with COVID, you won't get really sick or even die. And so my recommendation is we can all contribute to reducing COVID's impact by being vaccinated. And in your own life, you can reduce your risk of having long-term effects from COVID by being vaccinated. Oh, that was so beautifully said. Thank you. Um, so what would you say are some of the top myths that you hear circulating about vaccines? And can you help us debunk them? Yeah. So um, a lot of times we hear myths like um, vaccines make you feel worse than if you got the illness or vaccines cause the illness. And I, I do want to spend just a minute debunking that, which is vaccines are always given either a killed vaccine or an inact or a killed part of the virus or an inactive part of the virus. Those cannot give you the illness. Can you have side effects? Sure. You can have a sore arm. You can even have a low grade fever. You can feel kind of yucky for a day or two those side effects are not you being sick with whatever you got the vaccine for. Those side effects are about your body building this incredible immune system. It's a defense system against that virus for the future. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing we'll sometimes hear is that um, vaccines are a conspiracy. They are designed to, uh, for the healthcare system to make money. That's one of the theories I've seen. Um, I will tell you as a family physician, I did not ever make money on vaccines. I have absolutely lost money on vaccines. Um, and, and family doctors do vaccines and offer them in their offices because we know that it is a key to great preventive health and great future health for our patients, not because it's a money-making scheme. Mm -hmm. Thank you for setting the record straight on that. Um, all right. So we hear a lot about vaccine hesitancy. So how can we as individuals talk to our loved ones who might be mm. hesitant about getting vaccinated? Yeah, absolutely. That can be really hard. If you've gotten your vaccine and you see the value for it and someone that you really love does not see the value and has not gotten their vaccine and maybe you're worried about them or you're worried about somebody else, the two of you love, that you both love, um, I think that can be a really hard scenario. So the first thing I would say is anger and frustration that comes out in those conversations almost never gains ground. So one advice help your loved one make sure that they have a family physician or a trusted relationship with a primary care physician that lets them have those conversations about their specific health and their specific health risk in the context of a trusted relationship. The second thing I would say is um, offer your love and support, offer your example. Don't be worried about sharing why you got the vaccine or that you're worried about them or that you love them. Um, probably, though, sharing all the reasons why they should get the vaccine won't be really successful. So I usually find slow and steady um, wins the race in terms of helping people change their minds. Also, give people a space to land if they do change their minds that doesn't make them feel like they've backed down from a conflict or doubled back on something that was their value. I love that empathetic and, and patient approach. Uh, I, I, I agree. I think that that's, that that's an effective strategy. So thank you for sharing that. And then just finally, um, if someone has questions about vaccines, can you recommend any reliable or trusted sources of information? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to go back to that phrase I've said twice before, which is, I hope you have a family physician because your family doctor is the best source for trusted information about anything about your health, not just vaccines, but especially about vaccines. So that's thing one. Um, the second thing I'll do is tell you that familydoctor.org is a great 
website that is published by the American Academy of Family Physicians is a great trusted site in which you can get patient level detailed information to answer your questions. The CDC is also a great site, but can be a little complex for patients to navigate. So that's where I would point folks to. Dr. Brill, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise with us. This was really helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jess. This was wonderful. I appreciate the opportunity. So yeah, just to reiterate everything that Bertha said, which is obviously 100% spot on, right now, um, there are a few different vaccine options, but the vaccine is really recommended for older adults. As Bertha said, um, that age range of like 60 to 74, it's the may get the vaccine. That's a conversation that those folks should have with healthcare providers. Uh, But for the older, older adults, so age 75 and older, that's the should get the vaccine category. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there is a vaccine during pregnancy as well um, that could be given during weeks 32 to 36, uh, excuse me, yes, weeks 32 to 36 of pregnancy. Um, Some really great data on that. Uh, We've seen about 70 to 85% protection pass from mother to baby, um, and it provides great protection for infants during their six month, the first six months of life, which is when they're most vulnerable. So definitely happy that you brought up RSV. That is something um, that that has been on the radar. Um, So let's, I know, so we talked a bit about flu. There's one other thing, sorry, I know I'm all over the place, but I just wanted to talk about one other option. Um, I I get a lot of questions about um, the, um, sorry, the nasal flu vaccine. So there is a lot of needle phobia that does prevent a lot of people from getting the vaccine. So I wanted to mention that. Oh yeah, Sarah's raising Sarah's raising her hand. Oh, yeah, I'm a hu- huge needle phobia. I mean, it's such an ordeal whenever I get a vaccine. Like, I absolutely cannot look at the needle. Like, I have to have someone come hold my hand. Like, it's a whole thing. I hate well, needles, but I do it anyway. See, but but that's a very real thing and no judgment. I mean, I think that that is um, a real barrier for a lot of people, um, you know, to, to not to not get it. So I did want to mention that there is a nasal spray option, um, but it has very limited approval. So basically uh, this does contain, it's, it's not live. Well, it's weakened flu virus. It's called attenuated live flu virus. So it shouldn't replicate. It shouldn't cause virus, but in people who are immunocompromised, it's considered higher risk. So it's typically not recommended for people who are immunocompromised. It's also not recommended uh, during pregnancy. So this is approved for people aged two through 49 years. And this might be an option for you if you are someone with needle phobia. So just wanted to mention that briefly. Um, Can we move to COVID? Because obviously COVID has been in the news lately because the updated formulation has just been approved. And by the time this episode airs, I have a feeling People will, you know, lots of folks may have gotten their COVID, the updated COVID vaccine. So I thought that we should um, talk about it. So there are two main technologies used for the COVID vaccines, right? There's the mRNA vaccines. That's the um, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines that I think we m- most of us know about. Um, and then there's the Novavax vaccine, which is a protein subunit technology. Again, not going to do a deep dive on the technologies right now. But the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have been approved, and we expect that the Novavax approval will be coming, I think, in the coming weeks. Is that right, Bertha? Did you hear that? I don't know if you've heard anything, any updates on that front. Yeah, I believe so. I think it's um, certainly a less common option in the U.S., um, but but with some availability. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I think it's good that we have that option, you know, because I think there is unfortunately a lot of misinformation about the mRNA technology. And so some people are hesitant to get it, um, even though we know that they're safe. And by the way, mRNA technology has been studied for it's now over three decades. We have lots of data. Yes, including human data. Um, and I just I totally nerd out over the mRNA technology because we're seeing its application applications outside of COVID, right? I think there's some incredible um, trials underway for cancer and other things. So 
it bothers me that people poo poo that technology. Uh, but for those who do have reservations, uh, we do have this non mRNA option for folks. So Sarah, I think you did a little bit of research on some of the um, the data that we have on the mRNA vaccines. Uh, maybe we could share a little bit about that. Uh, and Bertha, before we started recording, you made a really great point, which is that we don't I, because this has not been, this is a new, vet, right? The updated vaccine has, is now only now being released. We don't have a ton of data on its real world effectiveness, but we do have data on the previous vaccines. And remember, this does not mean that, oh, they didn't study the safety you know, of the vaccines. Absolutely not. The thing that's changing is the specific strains that we're protecting, right? Or that we're protecting against. So the, the technology is not changing. The, the vaccines themselves have been studied and studied and studied before they get authorized, before they hit the market, and then lots of surveillance after the fact. So I just want to set the stage there. But Sarah, did you want to jump in with any uh, information about the vaccines? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just as a quick thing, like when when we're talking about strains, like this is what's this is this is due to the mutation of the genetic material within the virus, but it is still the virus itself. So um, I sort of mentioned when I was talking about like what a virus is, like how it's kind of like like an M and M, and like I like to think of like the different strains as like the diff different color M and Ms, right? But it's like it's still an M and M. Right. Like it's still it's whether it's a green M&M &M or yellow M&M, &M, like it's it's still an M&M. &M. So like that's just how just to conceptualize like what it is like that a strain is. Love an analogy. You all will Love know it. this about me. If you, if you keep if you keep with me on on complex biological topics, like I, I think if we break it down like that, it's a little easier to understand. Um, so anyway, yeah, as, as far as the uh, the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccinations, um, Last year, uh, it's estimated that vaccinations prevented um, 8 to 20 million illnesses just in the U.S. alone. And um, it's also estimated that these vaccinations prevented 4 to 5 million hospitalizations and between 400,000 and 500,000 deaths um, last year. And that's with um, a vaccination rate of only around, I think, like 40 to 50 percent of the eligible population. So, I mean, this this probably if if more people were vaccinated, these numbers would undoubtedly be a lot higher. But just to put it into context a little bit of like why, like what what are like the, just to give the the like so what of vaccinations? Well, this is why. Love yeah. that. And thank you. Yep. Yep. It, Bertha, go on. Sorry. Yeah. I wanted to come back to a point about um, about the vaccines not causing disease, because I think that's an important point to to underscore or underline. And um, what I also want to um, give to the audience is um, maybe um, some benefit to the doubt that they may have about what they experience when they get vaccinated. So um, reactogenicity is how we re individually react to vaccines. And it is entirely factual and true that um, these, these uh, vaccines that don't contain live virus or weakened virus do not make us sick. Like the virus is not coming into our body. The virus is not what's making us sick. But our bodies do react in different ways to um, the vaccines. And so people may feel a little bit more tired than usual. Um, some people may feel like they have a little bit of like a low grade fever potentially. Like, and, and we have some data that suggests that reactogenicity is actually um, partially genetically driven, which means that you may be genetically predisposed to feel a certain way after um, after uh, exposures to different things like a vaccine. And so while I, me, an individual, uh, human, uh, after vaccination have zero symptoms and can go on with my life as usual, my mom actually um, does feel a little bit sick after she gets her vaccines. And so, um, it, again, that does not mean that she's getting sick from the virus, but that there is some effect that she's feeling after being vaccinated and that that, vaccinate, that vaccination uh, symptomology, if you will, pales in comparison to what you may experience from the virus itself. And so, of course, like the benefits of being vaccinated um, greatly outweigh um, not being vaccinated. But I did want to put that out there because I don't want people to feel like what they experience after being vaccinated is like 
people gaslighting them about it. Oh my gosh, Bertha, I'm so happy that you said that. And actually that does remind me that that has been cited as a reason um, for some people getting the Novavax vaccine as opposed to the Pfizer or Moderna. I think if, if I'm remembering correctly in some of the trial data, um, the reactogenicity tended to be a, a bit, a little bit less pronounced for, for most folks. Again, it really is sort of, you know, individuals will respond differently. I think your point is extremely important that it's not, you're not experiencing the virus. You're not infected with the virus. It's just our body's reaction to being vaccinated. No, it, it's exactly, yeah. it's just your, it's just your immune system being like, all right, hurt. Like I, I, I recognize you like, yep, got it. Like we're, we're it's basically like that's that's just what that is love that all right so now let's just move uh, as as we wrap up this episode on some of the practical considerations timing stuff like that i'm going to kind of power through this but i want you both please feel free to jump in at any time um let's start with um let's see here the flu uh right now is a great time to get the flu vaccine right it's recommended september to october is the ideal time to get the vaccine for most people um one thing i wanted to note that for kids so young kids who are six months to eight years, if it's the first time um, or if they, you know, that they've ever received the flu vaccine, uh, you, they, they sometimes get two doses of the flu vaccine. And so in terms of the timing, the first dose should be as soon as the vaccine is available. And then the second dose comes at least four weeks after that first dose, um, ideally by the end of October. You can and should get the flu vaccine during pregnancy. You can get it any time during pregnancy. Ideally, you would get it early in the flu season. But obviously, if you're, if you're you know, if, if you're not pregnant at that time, just get it whenever you can at any point during your pregnancy. Um, for adults 65 and older, again, uh, you'll likely get either the high dose or an adjuvanted flu vaccine. Um, that happens automatically. If you go to your pharmacy, they see your 65 plus. Uh, and you, again, I mean, as for all, all folks, you really want to aim for that um, September, October. The goal is the reason for that. You don't want to get the vaccine too early. And I guess the point is moot because this is already September now. But you want your protection to really take you through flu season, right? So that's why we recommend September to October. Now for COVID, I'm going to start with if you're recently infected, because uh, as we all discussed, you know, we, we all recently, or I guess Bertha and I, we recently had COVID and so many people have recently had COVID because of this summer wave that we're experiencing. The typical recommendation is that you wait at least three months. And I've seen some experts say about four to six months. You really don't want to wait much longer than that. And the reason being, and this is going to be my lay person take on it, is that we do have some natural immunity after we get infected, right? And so it's unlikely that we'll get reinfected during that window of time. So you can wait a little bit of time. That being said, and please jump in, folks, if, if I'm mistaken here, it's not like there, there's harm in getting it sooner. It's, it's just that you can wait a few months because you will have some of that natural protection. Um, anything to add or clarify? Did I misspeak at all, Bertha or Sarah? <laughs> No, that sounds okay. good. No, that was, that was, that was a, yeah, that sounds good. Okay. That's a hundred percent correct. All right. I mean, now, in terms of if you were not recently infected, if you're one of the lucky folks who have been able to evade this summer wave, you can get the vaccine you know, now as soon as it's available. Um, some people are waiting a little bit later until like November-ish to provide that really peak protection. Remember, it takes a couple of weeks for our bodies to mount an immune response um, during the holidays when so many of us are gathering. Uh, so that's sort of a conversation that you can have with your healthcare provider. Um, so it's either get it now or you can wait a couple of months if you want to increase protection against that um, expected winter wave. Remember, it's totally safe to get your flu and your COVID vaccine at the same time. It's going to save you a trip. For me, I'm scheduling my flu vaccine um, for, for myself and my kids next week. And then because we had COVID in July, I'm going to wait a few more months to get the COVID vaccine. But if I didn't, I would be getting both at the same time. That's what I did last year. Um, and then also, if you're an older adult, you can also get your RSV vaccine at the same time and just knock out all, all three at once. Um, 
let's see what I know. Yeah, I, I gotta take all of mine at once, or the rise will chicken out. I gotta, I gotta just rip the band aid off, just do it all, and like love it. Um, same for pregnancy with the COVID vaccine, strongly recommended. This is a recommendation from all of the major medical associations. The American College of uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists strongly urges that you get your COVID vaccine and your flu vaccine during pregnancy. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to point out here is for immunocompromised individuals, uh, you may require some additional doses of the COVID vaccines. Again, this is a conversation to have with your provider, um, but there are some recommendations. So, so for most of us, we're going to get a once annual COVID vaccine and a once annual flu vaccine. But if you're immunocompromised, um, there are some recommendations that certain immunocompromised folks um, should get more than one COVID vaccine. All right. Did I miss anything major there, Bertha or Sarah? And is there anything else as we wrap up this episode that you feel is important to drive home? Um, anything you've heard that you want to clarify? Any main messages that you want to leave for folks? Well, I mean, we haven't uh, we haven't really uh, talked uh, about um, herd immunity at all. And like, I often feel I, I often like hear people will say like, well. Why should I get vaccinated if everyone else is getting vaccinated? I mean, like, what what's the what possible implications can me being vaccinated have? And then they use that as sort of an excuse to to not to not to not protect themselves and to not to not go get vaccinated. So, I mean, what what would you say to, to someone who 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 expresses that that viewpoint? Bertha, are you able to me? respond? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I would say, um, you know, I I came into this thinking that we would work together as a community society to protect one another. And I realized that we all have very individual um, needs and um, paths in, in how we function in society. Um, I think there is a lot to be said about um, yes, protecting oneself and or maybe feeling like one doesn't have to protect oneself, <laughs> that uh, this feeling of invincibility. But to the extent that um, we can think about those that are um, not as well um, protected um, with their natural immune systems, that we can think about those that don't have yet um, the privilege of ha of having vaccination available to them, either because of an existing condition and or because of age, um, that we work together to protect one another and that vaccination is one proven scientific way to do it. And so to the extent that people can keep that in mind, I think would be wonderful. Beautifully said. Um, a final yeah. thought. Oh, sorry, Sarah, were you going to say something? Oh, no, I just, my favorite thing is, uh, my, my favorite saying with regards to this is, is vaccination is a team sport. Love it. I love it. I absolutely love it. I did want to comment, actually, just uh, two quick things before we wrap up here. Um, one, I have been getting a lot of questions about a combo flu COVID vaccine. Uh, again, just to clarify, we are, it, it's looking like we're going to have a once annual COVID vaccine, just as we do with flu. And so, yeah, how great would it be if we can combine the two? Um, there are clinical trials underway. I believe I saw um and this is actually, this speaks to how rigorously the vaccines are studied. I believe the the um, the data for one of the trials wasn't all that impressive. So it's not moving forward at this time, but we will have, I mean, it's expected that we'll have a combo vaccine available in the future. That's sort of, you know, TBD, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, but, you know, I, I think we're all really saying the same thing. Viruses mutate, right? That's why we're getting a once annual vaccine. There are some vaccines, and this is a conversation for for another time, but there are some vaccines like the MMR vaccine that we get in childhood, and that provides lifelong immunity against things like the measles. Um, we're talking about different viruses. That's not the case with these respiratory viruses that are mutating and evolving rapidly. That's why we need these updates on an annual basis. Do we all do we love going to get shots and going to get vaccines? If you ask Sarah, clearly no. But these are a a great way to protect ourselves from these really severe outcomes, even if we're young, even if we're healthy, 
Two final really quick things. I feel like we'd be remiss if we didn't mention myocarditis. I see that quite a bit as hesitation for getting the mRNA COVID vaccines in particular. This is something, again, if you search our database, uspodsources.com, we have tons of content on that. Myocarditis is, it is a possible side effect um, or, excuse me, adverse event uh, to the mRNA vaccines, particularly for young young boys and teenagers, I believe slightly um, higher rate for the Moderna versus the Pfizer vaccine. I hope I'm not getting that wrong. I'll double check that and put that in the show notes. But you have to remember that myocarditis, first of all, it's typically mild and resolves with rest. And it's far more common with the virus itself. When we're comparing myocarditis rates after COVID infection and after flu, it's far higher than after vaccination. So yeah, transparently, it is a potential adverse event. But if you look at it, you know, risk benefit, and you consider the risks of the viruses themselves, you, you know, again, the the benefits far outweigh the risks when it comes to vaccination. Um, and, the, and just to yeah. jump in really quick, just yeah. to define, just for folks that don't know, myocarditis is just an inflammation of the heart muscle. Right. Just for, for people that don't know what that is. Thank you for saying, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I've missed that definition. And then the last thing, and Bertha, maybe we could just talk for like 30 seconds about this, is something I see a lot is, you know, you all were talking about the vaccines early on and saying that it was going to prevent transmission and stop us from getting COVID, but I still got COVID. People are still getting COVID or still, or you could still get the flu after getting vaccinated. A vaccine is not some sort of a magic bullet. The primary goal of the vaccines from day one was pre to prevent us from getting hospitalized um, and from dying, right? Um, and I will say earlier on, the, the vaccines were better at halting that transmission. But again, because the virus evolved so much, things change. Um, and actually, if you look at the data, they do provide some protection against that, but that's not their primary goal. So it's not that we lied. It's not that public health lied to you or Dr. Fauci lied to you or anything like that. Uh, the primary outcome has never changed just to prevent us from getting super sick, from dying, from overwhelming our healthcare system. And the vaccines have done an incredible, incredible job at that. Bertha, any final thoughts on that note before we wrap up? Yeah, no, I would describe it, I think, as um, not being a, a magical Superman shield bubble that um, pr that forms around us um, and prevents, again, those viral, viral particles from in, uh, coming into our body. So you're, you're exactly right. Um, it is meant to be a tool that can help us manage the virus once it enters our body and, and a defense against that virus once it starts replicating inside, which is exactly what it does um, and causes organ damage all over. So um, to the extent that people can view it as, as a helper, I think it's going to be a really great way of framing. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Bertha, Dr. Bertha Hidalgo. You can follow her on social media at Dr. Dr. Bertha Hidalgo. We're going to link to her page in our show notes. Um, really, thank you so much for, for lending your, your time and expertise today. Uh, we hope that after listening to this, you will go out and schedule your flu and COVID vaccines. Again, you can get them at the same time. Uh, or you can space them out. It's totally up to you, but it's safe to get them at the same time. Um, thank you, Dr. Sarah Scheinman, as always, my amazing co-host, uh, for lending your bio perspective and, you know, keep keeping up, keeping us in line, helping educate us about viruses and vaccines. Thank you all for your support, for tuning in. Please sign up for our Substack, which is our weekly newsletter. Um, we're, we're getting more consistent with pushing that out. Sarah's really helping co-author um, some incredible articles. I'm super proud of what we're pushing out. You could subscribe at theunbiasedipod.substack.com. Leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow along with our infographics on social media. We really are so genuinely grateful for your support across the board. Thanks, as always, for tuning in for No Nonsense, Just Science.